Thanks for watching. Let's talk about amoxicillin. Amoxicillin is an antibiotic in the penicillin family. It's a semi-synthetic analog of ampicillin because of its chemical structure. It's sometimes referred to as a beta-lactam antibiotic. It was discovered in 1958 in England. Second, amino penicillin to market here in the United States. The first one was ampicillin in 1961. Then came amoxicillin in 1972. Amoxicillin is on the World Health Organization list of essential medicines. It's a broad spectrum antibiotic and it was originally described from a fungus. It's one of the most commonly prescribed drugs in the United States and is the most commonly prescribed antibiotic in the United States. For the most part, it is an oral medicine. It can be given intramuscularly, but if an intravenous form is needed, we have to default to ampicillin because there is no IV amoxicillin in the United States. But it's important to realize that the blood levels, whether you take it orally, intramuscularly, or intravenously, the blood levels are all the same. That seems to be what counts. And as with any antibiotic, it's not for the common cold. It's not for viral infections. It's okay to take it with food. It comes in a variety of forms. It comes in capsules and tablets and chewable tablets. And it comes as a powder for reconstitution, mostly for children. It's a moderate spectrum antibiotic, good against both the gram-positive and the gram-negative organisms. If you need a beta-lactam antibiotic, it seems to be the drug of choice in the class. It seems to have better absorption than many of the other beta-lactam antibiotics. And the spectrum is a little bit broader than to standard penicillins. Now, since it's been around for so long, bacteria have a chance to become resistant to it. But for the most part, it still can be used for strep infections, hemophilus infections, moraxilla infections, can be used for certain E. coli infections. E. coli infection is extremely common. And it still works against Neisseria meningitis the cause of meningitis. On the other hand, it is not good for bacteroides, the cause of intra-abdominal infections, and it isn't very good, it doesn't work for people who have infections with Klebsiella or Proteus or Pseudomonas, which are major infectious organisms that occur especially in people who have kidney disease, kidney stones, or people who have chronic obstructive lung disease. And we're finding increasing resistance to Salmonella, Shigella, to staph, and to certain other forms of E. coli. The way the medicine works, works in two fashions. One is it forms hydroxyl radicals inside the cell and kills the cell. And the other thing it does is it prevents the bacteria from making the cell wall. If the bacteria can't make the cell wall, then they leak and they become dehydrated and they die that way. Well, it's cell cycle dependent, of course. The cell has to be actively growing. It can't be in the resting phase. And the drug is bactericidal. Some of the antibiotics, for instance, the tetracyclines and the sulfa drugs, those drugs are bacteriostatic. They stop the organism from growing, but they don't kill it. So they depend on the body's immune system to get rid of the organism. With the amoxicillin, it will kill the antibiotic. The only difference, actually, between the amoxicillin and the ampicillin is a hydroxyl group on one of the side chains. But the activity is basically the same. It doesn't matter whether you take the amoxicillin or the ampicillin. But because there's better absorption with the amoxicillin, actually you get two to two and a half times higher blood levels with it, that means that there isn't much use for ampicillin anymore. The medicines, the penicillin family, originally discovered in 1928 by Alexander Fleming, discovered it from a fungus, a fungus called Penicillium notatum, now called Penicillium chrysogenum, there are five different classes of the penicillin drugs. The most common are the natural penicillins. That's penicillin V, penicillin G, the penicillinase resistant penicillins. That's methicillin. And then we have the amino penicillins, of which the most common are ampicillin and amoxicillin. But since the 
amoxicillin is in the penicillin family. It means if you're allergic to penicillin, you can't take this. What are the side effects if you take the drug? Well, side effects are you can develop a rash. The rash is probably the most common side effect. Rash can occur any time while you're taking the drug, even up to a week or so after you discontinue taking the drug. Allergic reactions, non-allergic reactions rather, can occur in anywhere between maybe about 3 and 10 percent of people. Usually they start at least 72 hours after you've been taking the medicine, it can occur in people who've never taken a penicillin before. It usually looks like a measles-type eruption or a little reddish bump scattering around. Start off centrally and then spread to the extremities. If a person happens to have mononucleosis and takes the drug, and you shouldn't take the drug if you have mononucleosis because mononucleosis is not susceptible. Remember, that's a viral infection. But if you do have mononucleosis, 80 to 90 percent of the time you will develop a rash when you take the amoxicillin. The medicine also can cause some nausea or vomiting and can cause some diarrhea. The diarrhea can be relatively mild. It's less common than with uh, ampicillin. But sometimes it could be a very severe diarrhea. It could be a severe diarrhea where you have watery, bloody stools, sometimes associated with cramps or fever, even colitis, overgrowth of an organism known as Clostridium difficile. That can be very important and can occur while you're taking the drug or even up to a couple months after you stop the drug. Bacterial overgrowth on the tongue can lead to a black tongue. You have to remember that if there is an allergy to penicillin or amoxicillin, chances are there's going to be a fair chance of some kind of an allergy to cephalosporin. But fortunately, most people who think they're allergic to penicillin really are not. We can get a super infection if you kill off the so-called good bugs, then you can have some overgrowth of yeast or you can have overgrowth of some other bacteria that cause kind of problems. Some of the rare side effects are lightheadedness or insomnia. Some people get confused or become anxious or sensitive to light and sound. You can have an allergic reaction to the medicine, especially if you happen to have either asthma or hay fever or urticaria hives, history of any of those. Allergic reactions can come on quite suddenly. They start off oftentimes with some nausea, vomiting, and then a rash. But the rash with an allergies oftentimes begins around the fingertips or the groin and then spreads very rapidly, sometimes with a fever and in a changed mental state. The skin rash can become quite severe. You can develop redness of the entire skin. You can have altered liver functions. You can become anemic. You can have other sorts of problems. And at some times it may be a fatal reaction. You can take the medicine if you happen to have kidney disorders, but if you have deteriorated kidney function, you might have to lower the dose. It's okay if you happen to be pregnant to take the drug. It doesn't seem to cause any harm to the fetus, doesn't cause any impairment of fertility. If you're breastfeeding, it's still okay to take the medicine. Some will get into the breast milk, but we use the medicine in children. In the pediatric age group, especially in the newborns or the very young infants, then we have a situation where the kidneys aren't fully mature, so you can't fully eliminate the drug. So we're a little bit cautious with the dose in neonates or in young children, geriatric population, pretty much the same thing. As the kidneys become less functional with age, then we might want to decrease the dose somewhat. The common infections for which we use amoxicillin, well, they're the ear, nose, and throat infections, middle ear infections, or strep throat, or maybe certain forms of bacterial sinusitis. A person might have strep pneumonia, and certain kinds of sensitive staph or sensitive haemophilus influenza infection. For genital urinary infection, sometimes it's used for acute cystitis, although with increasing resistance of the E. coli, that might not be as good a choice. Sometimes it's used for asymptomatic bacteriuria. In pregnancy, it's used in skin disease for cellulitis or impetigo. And it's sometimes used for Lyme disease or for people who have community-acquired pneumonia. At times previously, it was used for gonorrhea. That's another form of Neisseria. Neisseria meningitidis caused the meningitis. Well, this is Neisseria gonorrhea that causes the genital infection. Now it's pretty much resistant in many areas of the world. The Haemophilus, I'm sorry, the H. pylori, the Helicobacter pylori, the organism that causes the stomach ulcer that may go on and perhaps 
lead to ulcers or in some cases gastric cancer, well, that was once upon a time commonly treated with what we call triple therapy, amoxicillin and clarithromycin and a proton pump inhibitor. But now it seems that there's a lot of resistance to that, so that's sort of out. And then formerly it was used for a lot of gastrointestinal infections, gastrointestinal infections with salmonella and shigella, but now we have increased resistance. Now there's some interactions, so we have to be a little bit careful, as I mentioned a moment ago, with some of the antibiotics, the antibiotics like the sulfa drugs or the erythromycin drugs or tetracycline drugs, chloramphenicol, those are all bacteriostatic drugs, so they wound the organism, they prevent it from dividing, but the penicillin needs the organism to be dividing, so it sort of defeats the purpose. There is another medicine known as probenicid, probenicid very commonly used to treat the gout, well, in addition, what it does is it prevents the excretion or delays the excretion of amoxicillin from the body, so it increases the time the amoxicillin is going to be present, it increases the concentration of the amoxicillin, which might be a good thing. You have to be a little careful if you're taking warfarin, the blood thinner, if you happen to be taking methotrexate, if you happen to be taking allopurinol, the dose of the medicine, well, you take it every eight hours or every 12 hours, depending on the situation that's at hand. We know that it readily absorbs from the gastrointestinal tract, gets into the tissues very quickly, gets into the body tissues, even penetrates into the central nervous system, especially if you happen to have some inflammation of the meninges. The onset is within about half an hour. The half-life of the medicine longer, as I mentioned in children, about three to four hours. If we look at adults, it's only about one to two hours. Only 20% of the medicine is bound. That means 80% is unbound, and it's the unbound fraction of the medicine that's active in the system, so that's good. 60% goes out in the urine in six to eight hours, so we have high concentration in the kidneys, high concentration in the bladder, and as a matter of fact, there's what we call an enterohepatic circulation, so it gets into the intestine, and then it's reabsorbed, then goes into the liver, and it travels back out into the intestine. So that means we have a significant increase in the concentration in the bile and in the stool. Overdose, well, that's not really an issue. If you take too much of the antibiotic, it might crystallize out, so we make sure that you're hydrated. The dose is anywhere between 250 milligrams and two grams or 2,000 milligrams, either twice a day or three times a day for adults and children over 90 pounds, depending on the severity of the infection. For children under 90 pounds, it's dosed on the basis of the body weight. Now that means for common ear, nose, and throat infections, skin infections, genital urinary infections of moderate to uh, mild intensity, the dose could be 500 milligrams every 12 hours or 250 milligrams every eight hours. If a person has severe infection, then we boost the dose. We go up to about 875 milligrams every 12 hours or 500 milligrams three times a day. You have to take about 80% of the dose in order for it to be fully effective and in order to prevent resistance or to reduce the likelihood of resistant organisms. Now there's an issue with people taking the medicine as a prophylactic drug when they see the dentist because they're worried about bacterial endocarditis. Now the rules have sort of been tightened, so if you happen to have a prosthetic valve, if you happen to have prosthetic material used to repair your valve, if you have a past history of endocarditis, or if you have certain forms of congenital heart disease, or if you had a heart transplant, then it might be wise to take the drug prior to the time you have a dental procedure where there's going to be manipulation of the gingival tissues or the periapical tissue, the region around the top of the tooth, or there's going to be perforation of the oral mucosa. It's not used for just common cleaning of the teeth. It also can be used for people who are going to have procedures performed on the respiratory tract or on infected skin or infected tissue underneath the surface of the skin. But there's no specific link, and no reason to take prophylaxis if you're going to have a gastrointestinal procedure or even a genitourinary tract procedure because the bacteria that tend to cause mischief in the heart 
are different. So we're worried more about the upper respiratory or sometimes the skin. The dose would be single dose, 30 to 60 minutes before your procedure, amoxicillin at a dose of two grams, one time only, or it could be clindamycin, 600 milligrams one time only, or maybe cephalexin, two grams taken once only. Now, as I mentioned, for Helicobacter pylori, for the stomach infection, it used to be that we would use clarithromycin and amoxicillin and a proton pump inhibitor for two weeks. That's sort of obsolete, and as of 2017, the official recommendation of the American College of Gastroenterology is that you take the clarithromycin and the amoxicillin and metronidazole, combine those three drugs with a proton pump inhibitor for two weeks, but if you've ever taken clarithromycin in your entire life, then the helicobacter are going to be resistant to the clarithromycin, and then the appropriate four-drug treatment would be bismuth and tetracycline and the metronidazole and the proton pump inhibitor, and forget the clarithromycin and forget the amoxicillin. The likelihood of eradication with any of those regimens, 70, 80 percent, the likelihood of being reinfected. Most people are infected with helicobacter pylori in their childhood, the likelihood of being reinfected in adulthood, less than 1% a year. The good news about amoxicillin is it's very inexpensive. You can get a month's worth, I'm, I'm sorry, you can get a course worth of therapy for cash, about $20, and if you have a coupon someplace like GoodRx, well, you could get it for about $10. Now, you can't get the Amoxo brand. They stopped making it because it's now so inexpensive. So you have Amoxicillin, it's a very good antibiotic, but remember, it's only good for certain bacterial infections, bacterial infections with sensitive organisms. It's not good for the common cold. So it's still good, even though it's been around for a long time. And that's the story. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the show, eh, subscribe. Maybe tell a friend about us. Anyway, I'm Dr. Ken Landau.